Hi, Sasha. Hi, Stella. How are you? This was a very interesting conversation, wasn't it? Yeah, we talked to Kate Goonan today, who you, of course, work with in Genspect. And uh, for the last couple of years, she was studying the evidence base around gender dysphoria. And she uh, is a physician who realized something is not right here. So she started working in Genspect in more of an advisory role. So um, Kate works with parents who are trying to communicate with their specialists, their physicians, their psychologists in their schools. And we spend a lot of time today talking about what Kate has seen in her work around interacting with the school, navigating the school system. And we touch on a lot of really interesting things that are very important for families to understand. So Kate talked about the importance of having a plan, rallying the troops, so to speak. And she talked about this kind of alternative way of creating a really strong support system to help inoculate a young person from kind of harmful voices and harmful ideas. Because, you know, so many parents want to do this kind of nuclear option thing where they they pick up, they realize the school is undermining their authority, they move to some remote country, some distant land, and then they kind of surround their kid with love and family support. And not everyone can do that. And Kate kind of talks about ways to make this happen without actually picking up and, and changing your entire life, which I thought was really great. It's really helpful. As as a therapist myself, I try to stay away from, you know, psychologists who give these extraordinarily difficult options for families to take and nobody can. It's like, well, yeah. and I, we, I, I hope I don't fall into it. I'm sure I do. But Kate very much is on the ground and, you know, g- gives it socks about this is the realistic options, you know, yes. families can do. So will I, I tell you a little bit about Kate. She's a board yes. certificate. Oh, yeah, I, I want to say one more thing about oh, yeah. what we talked about, though. In yeah. a similar fashion, she points out that sometimes parents think they have to take on the whole school system, the whole school culture. And in the same kind of vein of like start somewhere manageable, she talks about the importance of just focus on your individual child and their needs rather than trying to take down gender identity in schools in a broad sense. So I just, I love the practical and simple, clear advice that she offers to parents through this conversation and through Genspect. But yes, tell us a little bit more because Kate has a a really interesting background. Yeah, she's a highly qualified professional. She's a board certified physician. She graduated from the University of California at Davis School of Medicine, completed her residency at Massachusetts General Hospital. And after several years of practicing primary care and women's health, she her career focus moved to evidence based medicine and quality improvement. She served as medical director overseeing medical policy and quality for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. And she also authored two books on quality in healthcare and was appointed as a judge for the U.S. Presidential Award for Performance Excellence in Business, Healthcare and Education. Yes, she's very impressive. And as you'll hear, she's very compassionate and um, really wonderful support for parents and a great resource. So here's our conversation with Dr. Kate Goonan. Hi, I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Through in-depth interviews, personal stories, and psychological exploration, we probe the gender landscape within contemporary culture. And we consider the implications of prioritizing personal identity over other aspects of the self. This is the thinking person's take on gender. Join us as we look at gender from a wider lens. Hey, Sasha, how are you? Hi, Stella and Kate. I'm great. How are you? It's great to have Dr. Kate Goonan here with us. I met Kate first in Dublin. She, you're originally from America and live in America. And she messaged me just within our networks. She said, oh, I'll be in Dublin. Do you fancy meeting? And I thought, oh, yeah, OK. We didn't know each other at all. We just knew both of us were interested in gender. And we went for a lovely dinner with you and your husband. It was really lovely. <laughs> and that was two summers ago. And since then, we've started working together. And uh, the work you actually have... it was more interesting than that. You were yeah. due to go on a trip with Sasha, and I it couldn't know. happen because of COVID. 
Yes. Oh yeah. Or he was going to visit. Right. States on vacation, and you couldn't go because of COVID, and so you. I was, I was devastated. I was, I was Step in. <laughs> yeah, it was that famous me trying to get out of Ireland during COVID. Yeah. And see, Sasha and Lisa were very, very nice about it. <laughs> and yeah, they, we, we, uh, we moved our trip because Stella couldn't get in. And, and it was I, so I, I, sad. And we, felt, we we were able to rearrange. I sent them this abrupt message saying, go without me. <laughs> 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 and they came back at me very quickly and said, oh, listen, calm down there. We'll change the trip. But I was mortified, and so yeah. And then the one upside about the whole sorry mess was I was a, I was able to message you, Kate, and say I can meet you. I'm, I'm locked <laughs> yeah. in this country. I'd forgotten that. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But well, since Kate, then, since then you started work really pretty much very quickly after we met. We discussed you maybe coming to work in Genspect, and you did, and you. You've been such a jewel in, in our in our work, like really and truly, wow. you know, there's a few people who work at Genspect who are kind of unacknowledged kind of heroes, really, really mm. important kind of elements. And parent advocacy and Kate has been a, a real jewel in the crown. And I'm delighted to welcome you here today. <laughs> oh, that's, thank you so much. No, it was a complete gift, total gift for me. I was getting ready to retire and I was trying to figure out, okay, I'm no longer going to have a full-time job. I have plenty of skills. How can I put them to work in this area? Because I felt passionate about this area and you, you happen to not be able to go to the States on vacation. And we sat down for dinner and we talked about my credentials and my past as a primary care doctor and as someone who worked in the insurance world and worked in health systems and understands administration, my father was a pediatrician, I understand pediatrics. And you know, what do, what do primary care doctors do? They manage specialists. That's what we do. We, we take a blood pressure, we do a GYN exam, and then we manage specialists. And so I knew I know how the system works and that's what these parents need is somebody who can teach them how to manage the world that they're living in and the very complicated thing of asserting yourself yeah we have specialists very tricky stuff that's such a good oh. point because i think about families that i've met who have been navigating this gender issue in the context of their schools or their physicians and it's the parents who are really able to educate themselves on what's going on, advocate for themselves in in a confident way who are able to get through it. And I think families who really struggle are the ones who either turn over all of their authority to the professionals or ones who are not quite informed and so they feel really unsure. So I think the, the work you do helping families to feel more competent and capable is huge. And I'd love to start off by maybe Kate sharing with us some of the stories that you've heard about families who are struggling, who are having a hard time navigating these systems, and then you kind of step in to to support them. But like, what does it look like when families are struggling in this context? And also give a background of what your role is, what you made of your role, how how it started mm -hmm. with Genspect. Yeah, how it started. So, um. Genspect was getting emails from people and um, we have a colleague who was responding to those emails and was writing these beautiful emails back that would link to the most recent article or the most recent relative or relevant podcast. And then uh, she would copy me and she would say, and if you would like to speak to Dr. Kate Goonan, although it, it, early on, initially, I was anonymous because I was uh, fearful for my um, career and fearful. I was still fully employed when I started this. And um, I was nervous, like so many of our professional colleagues are, about coming out in this uh, world. So, uh, and then I would, I would schedule a Zoom. This is what I do now. I schedule a Zoom or a phone call with uh, parents and talk to them. And there were both enormous similarities about every story. And then there were also very unique characteristics in every story. So the, the common story was ROGD kids, 
typically they're almost almost all of the i would say 150 parents i've talked to in the last year and a half are parents maybe maybe 10 of them are uh, parents of young children the rest are all parents of adolescents um and um who who came came across you know who the, all of a sudden the the child has come out as non-binary or trans or or many things and it was very interesting a year and a half ago they didn't have information or they didn't really know where to get the information they were looking for groups they were looking for literature they wanted to get educated and it, i was getting educated at the same time um but we would we would explore the the literature together we would educate ourselves together and i would spend two or three or four phone calls whatever it took for them to get confident in understanding you know they they came into it with all these myths and all this confusion because they'd seen a pediatrician or they met with a psychologist and they they had their reality which is my child was a girly girl or a maybe a normal boy or a mildly effeminate boy but they knew that they were boy or girl and then they saw a psychologist or they met with a pediatrician or some expert and they were told that this needed to be fluid that this the truth was this was fluid and they were just flummoxed stressed um it completely disoriented. So we would go through the information and get a grounding. So a year and a half ago, it was a lot about information. Uh, it's, it's changed dramatically over the last year and a half. But when we started, that was the task. And then the task, of course, was I put on my primary care doctor hat and say, okay, because I've done this with, I've done it with cancer patients. I've done it with people with diabetes, with all kinds of problems. Okay how do we want to interact with those specialists and what questions do we want to ask and what is the right posture posture to have as as the parent dealing with these specialists um and and that would that of course would vary depending on where they live um although it's it's pretty prevalent across the whole country uh but if they were in oregon or in the san francisco bay area um we had to be very very careful um southern california pretty much all of california um, you know, very careful about how we challenge the authority of the clinicians that the family was dealing with and the schools as well. So um, first and foremost, it was education, but then it was what is going to be our plan for how we're going to approach this with the, with the clinicians, with the school, and with our network of family, our family and friends. And we have to have a plan for how we're going to handle this with those three groups. So that would take some time. And I would meet with people several times until they felt like they had a plan. Yeah, what stands out to me about that is really a kind of preparing oneself and having some structure and being willing to face this head on. Because I think sometimes, and please share like your experience of this, but I think when families are really struggling is when they feel totally lost. They're just kind of crossing their fingers that maybe the kid won't bring it up again. Or like if we go along with the pronouns, maybe everything will be better. But like not really having enough confidence to say, okay, as the parent in this situation, here's how we adults are going to support this kid how we're going to help manage this kid's gender distress like have you have you met families who um due to like a, a lack of preparedness or planning really had a hard time with the schools like can you talk about that in the school's context i, I think most families don't have a clear idea of how to approach the school and and it's very distressing because they're bombarded yeah. with all these competing negative messages right they're they're being told there's something wrong with them that they're not affirming that's the underlying message coming from everywhere so they need to be able to appreciate the culture of the school the culture of the adults around them in their community is projecting that message onto them that they have failed they should be affirming and any doubts they have are are to be questioned so they're they've got to come to accept that they're normal they're fine the culture around them is is dishing out 
uh, all kinds of beliefs that that aren't true, and they've got to they got to develop a thick skin about it, and and a way that they're going to bolster themselves to deal with it. So I like to spend some quality time with parents figuring out what is the culture of the school, what is the policy of the school that their child is facing, because that's really important. We need to sort out is is this a an issue of one teacher or or one counselor? Uh, is it the overarching culture of the school? Is it the principal of the school? Who exactly is pushing any kind of gender belief system onto the child? Because in most environments, in most schools, you're not going to be able to change the whole school. You're not going to be able to take on their policies, their culture, their belief. And what I urge parents to think about is what is happening to their child? So I like to encourage parents to focus on their own child. And if we have the option to influence the adult authority figures in that child's life who are confusing the child, let's try to work with them around this one unique child. So we're not trying to take on the gender belief system or the whole culture of the school. We're just trying to get those adults around this child to agree to uh, a, a plan for that child. So for example, if it's a music teacher and the Spanish teacher, the parents uh, ask for a meeting with those two teachers. And if in a meeting with those two teachers, the parents can explain they're open-minded, they are inclusive of trans people and gay people in their lives. This is not about the civil rights issue. This is about my child. And my child has experiences with some depression. They've been on ADHD medication. They lost a best friend. Whatever the, the, the context of the child is, we have researched this and it's really important that we not change their pronouns and we not change their name or whatever the, the plan is. But the minimal, you know, ideally we say, just please work with us around staying aligned with what we're doing at home. We're not changing pronouns or names at home. And um, she's feeling less stressed and she's doing better. And if you could help us and work with us around that. And then... Sometimes that works. Sometimes that's all it takes. And if that's all it takes, that's great because it's very difficult to take on the whole school. And it, it's not necessary. Um, and I, I find it's interesting. I find I need to remind parents they don't need to change the whole school. They need to focus on their child. And I've had some families that have had good luck with that. Why do you think parents feel the need to take on the whole school? Because we don't generally, you know, I've worked with parents a lot with bullying, you know, over the years. And, you know, it's 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 it seems it's such a politicized issue that maybe parents feel sometimes understandably the need to educate the whole school because so many people maybe have misinformation. Or what is it that you think is 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 driving a lot of parents in this context? You know, that that is a really great question. And I've thought about that a lot. I. I can tell you my opinion. I think the most compelling data around this question comes from this recent study um, from Northwestern University where uh, Michael Bailey, the social psychologist, worked with one of the ROGD kid networks and did surveys of lots of adults. So I think it was 1,600 parents. And their research found that most parents in that sample, it's one study, 1,600 families, but he estimated 80% of the parents tended to be progressive-minded and um, kind of committed to civil rights and social justice and such. And I think, so, and that's, that was, has been my experience as well. Over, I would say easily over 80% of the parents I've talked to are of that cultural orientation. So I think they tend to feel that it, it's somehow their obligation to speak up in the school and 
the speech is almost starts with, I've been a lifelong um, progressive minded Democrat or, or independent or whatever. And I know I've studied this and I realize this is not a civil rights issue. These are children who are struggling and we need to support them in a different way and not simply jump to the idea that they know they're trans and therefore the school needs to affirm them. And they feel very emotional about this. Um, so I think that that's where, and the other thing I will say is they, they, show, they show great relief when I say, that's not your job right now. Your job right now is your family, your child. And let the rest of us who aren't dealing with your family and your challenges take on the bigger questions while you take care of yourself as you two are so eloquently, regularly telling parents uh, and then your own child. And so you don't even need to say, my child's part of a movement. My child's not part of a movement. My child has ADHD. They lost their best friend who moved out of the town. They're feeling very isolated. And so I just need you to work with me around their anxiety. And, and this will be a short-term uh, thing that they're thinking about their gender. And many, many teachers will, will go along with that. Can I ask a, a kind of practical question? Earlier, you mentioned something about gender ideology or something along those lines. Given that we're talking about being really specific regarding the individual child and their particular needs and their particular struggles, um, is, there, is there specific language that you may invite parents to use? Like, would you tell, uh, would you suggest for a parent to say something like, please don't share gender ideology with my child or... How, how can families maybe frame this in a way that you think is cooperative with the school and doesn't kind of raise these political red flags? Like, I'm wondering if that is something that you think about, because I think about that a lot. I agree with you about that. I, I, I would not use the term gender ideology. I would not use any political language at all. I would stay focused on my child has these needs, they have been thinking about this a little bit, but they're really actually reacting to the loss of a grandmother or the fact that we moved recently or um, their dog died or, you know, anything. And, um, and they, know, they know two or three other children who are exploring this, but this is completely new and at home, they're not thinking about it at all. And um, so I would ask you to partner with me so you don't use any political language at all. And you simply, and you say, you know, I'm a very open-minded person, I, I, but my child has these needs. Can we partner around this? And as much as you can get a dialogue going with anybody who touches the child, who's an adult authority figure and build a relationship with them, talk to them regularly, yeah. uh, make it light, yeah. make it, um, it kind and, and friendly, get to know them because they will then uh, work with you. I do believe mm -hmm. most adult authority figures want to work with parents. Can, can I ask one more question? I know Stella wants to jump in. Um, what are some examples of the challenges that a family will face if they don't kind of take the reins and jump in? Like, can you share any experiences you've had with parents who felt really overrun by the school or like they just didn't jump in. And so something um, kind of happened that impacted their kid in a negative way. Well, I mean, I will say to be honest in the last year and a half, the majority of cases, um, the partnering approach has been difficult and hasn't really worked. So most of the stories I could tell you are where the school is persisting in um, socially transitioning the child in the, in the United States. Um, and I've only talked to, you know, a handful of people in Scotland and, and the UK and Canada um, in the, in the U S um, the majority will, insist on um, moving forward with social transition 
um, and actually project onto parents very negative um, judgments about why they would not want to socially affirm a transition, which makes it very difficult. Um, I can think of one family where early on um, we attempted a variety of approaches to the school at multiple levels, starting at the lowest level, like we're talking about here, where just the people around the child, let's not make a big deal out of this. And then they took it to the next level with the counselors and the, and the school administration. And then they went on to um, intervene with uh, threats of legal action. And the school basically refused to uh, back down and uh, it it hasn't had a happy ending. Um, so I can't I can't tell you that we're having huge amounts of success if the immediate teachers around the child aren't sympathetic to building a partnership. Which is why I've come to say let's let's just start. Let's not make a big deal out of this. Let's go to the teachers uh, around your child who will be responsive to the idea that maybe they're committed to uh, socially transitioning children who, whenever they say that they're exploring this, but if they'll listen to you about your child's unique situation, they will be more flexible. So, so you seem to say that at first that it was positive and then it, you kind of said that the, the, there wasn't many success stories. W is there a differentiation between that? You were kind of at the beginning, you were saying, you know, it was going quite well. So what, what, what is the difference? I, I'm not following that. Well, um, I mean, most of the parents I talk to have attempted the approaches we just, I'm describing, and most of them ha have found them unsuccessful. Um, I would say on the majority now, I also, I'm not practicing medicine and I'm not keeping records. So, because I'm, I'm keeping their confidence. I do everything. I, every parent I talk to, I do it in confidence. And, um, I advise them around how to, how to approach the school. Um, but it's very common for parents to have to move to an entirely different strategy. So changing schools pulling the child out and homeschooling. Um, to, I will say that the, the, the group that have the best luck are the ones who say for the summer, they take the child. I, one family I've worked with for a long time in the Northwest, um, they send their teenage daughter uh, to Texas to visit, to spend the summer with family. And they, they couldn't move but they could send her to live with an aunt and uncle on a, on a farm, on a ranch, and she would desist over the summer. And then she would come back and she would get back into school with her friend group and they didn't have other good school options. And then she would move back into it. And then she, yeah. there've been two summers now where by putting her in a different environment for the summer, she will desist over the summer. I mean, this just, as you know, you work with teenagers, teenagers are genuinely yeah. fluent and they're genuinely yeah. influenced by the people around them. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. I, I totally see that all the time. During spring break, the week away with my kid, we saw her old self come back. And then when she went back to school or even on long weekends, sometimes you see, glimmers yes. of the child's personality returning. So that peer influence is just so huge. We hope you're enjoying this episode of our podcast. We work very hard to maintain high quality content for the show. To take an even deeper dive and support the show, join our listener community for access to exclusive content, practical tools and resources supporting gender and identity exploration. We're so grateful to our sponsor, Genspect, an international organization which offers an alternative to WPATH, providing a range of education, resources, and supports to anyone impacted by gender distress, GenSpect unites many different organizations globally and gives voice to thousands of previously untold stories. For more info, visit genspect.org. And thank you to our sponsor, Rhyme. 
Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics is a non-profit organisation dedicated to improving long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. And now back to the conversation. Um, you, you also talked before we, we started recording about how you started to get involved in the Beyond Transition Project through Genspect, and that shifted your perspective too about how to best kind of get involved. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Sure. Um, so when we were first launching Beyond Transition, now called Beyond Trans, um, I uh, took on the responsibility of interviewing the people who came to us for services. And I interviewed um, the first 30 or so people that came to us. Uh, and I cherish every one of those conversations. These people were so generous, um, telling me their stories. And uh, and then I went to work on finding them therapists, just, just so the listeners know, Beyond Trans is a program where we identify therapists who will work with people who've transitioned, maybe or maybe not detransitioned, but are still feeling a need for support. And we subsidize their therapy and we find people who are informed and experienced who will work with them. So I would then go out and, and find them a therapist and set them up to be um, to have their visits that we would then as GenSpec subsidize. And so these were young adults, mostly in their early 20s up until their mid 30s. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed meeting all of them and getting them set up. But what I came to realize was these are folks that have a lot of very complicated issues ahead of them. A lot of I could help them with a little bit with their medical issues, but I'm not a trained therapist. I'm just a, a, a primary care internal medicine board certified doctor. Uh, and I really felt that uh, it, we needed to uh, have somebody else at the helm of screening them and matching them with therapists. And that's when Joe Burgo took over and um, we've redesigned the program and it's working beautifully and we're helping so many people. Um, but there, it, it was very clear to me that, that folks have gone through transition are dealing with a whole host of issues related to regret, related to reestablishing their relationships with others, sorting out their medical issues and their psychological issues, where they want to go from here. And so for me, what it meant to me was I wanted to go back and focus on parents and helping them figure out strategies that would enable them to support their children. And that meant getting very creative about how we're going to tackle the issue of schools. Mm -hmm. And did you think when, after seeing, I suppose, the pretty harrowing stories from beyond trans, did it almost reinvigorate or change your MO towards how you'd work with parents in schools? It did reinvigorate and change it. I will say that was the turning point for me when I realized and this is something both of you talk about a lot, is not only should this very clearly be first and foremost addressed in the family, but it needs to be addressed first and foremost, if it's addressed at all by any professionals with exploratory therapy. And I mean, we know that's now the standard of care. That is what Finland is doing, Sweden is doing. Uh, we know why we need to focus there, but it, what, it, what the insight that I took from it was we need to get very creative about helping people think of this as, as establishing the net of adults, caring adults around the child, grandmother, aunts, uncles, cousins, the extended family and the, and the trusted friends around a child who can help them accept reality who can make the gentle comments, you look very nice today in that dress. <laughs> you, you look happy today. I, um, I understand you're, you're going back to piano. Um, what, what has attracted you about going back to piano or dance or, um, you know, getting a team of trusted adult advisors and, and, um, 
to around to create a cultural environment to to focus the cultural environment around the kid to help them come to terms with accepting themselves loving themselves exactly as they are and to take that part very seriously so on our when i give talks about this now i talk about the medical approach the psychological approach and then i've added a, a part about cultural and family approach and let's get really serious about saying all right who are the adults in this my kid's life who i trust who i can educate who need to actually know that how to be a gentle um advocate for them and their self-love exactly as they are however gen gender non-conforming they are in whatever way they're gender non-conforming they are absolutely perfect just the way they are and we love them and and to surround them with that you know and it's you know the family rituals around food and the family rituals around trips and holidays and spending you know i know several families that i've over the last year they spending more time with great aunt nelly because the child happens to really admire great aunt nelly and feels totally comfortable there or you know those kinds of things those little cultural changes that seem to really be because so many families cannot pick up and leave i mean we do know the success stories of people who've extracted their child and moved to another country or moved but my, the vast majority of families can't do that so how do we simulate that how do we create an environment where the child has got a world around them that is different including if it needs to be different than the school and so it was after talking to the the tr the transitioned people who would tell these stories about so many adults in their lives who reinforced adults and professionals my colleagues your colleagues you know the people that i think the three of us are most angry with our professional colleagues who led them on to think that they can change their sex and how confusing that was and how uh, the stories that they would tell about how betrayed they feel. So I just thought, well, I'm going to go back and work, you know, on prevention. Primary care, we try to prevent cancer. We try to prevent blood pressure and diabetes. So how do we prevent this in families and, and help a more natural approach to desistance occur? And we don't, you know, we don't have any good statistics on desistance because this is not treated as an experimental medical intervention. We're never going to know. Um, but I think that's, that's where parents can take control by deciding every weekend we're going to make plans to do a sport or go to a music or do uh, a theater thing or and expose our children to these people, not those people. And uh, taking the reins, like you all say so nicely about how I, I heard you interviewed about your book recently, Stella, and you were saying uh, taking the devices away at, at eight or 10 o'clock and, and your teenagers and when you take them away and all those changes are what's going to make a difference. And I think we are starting to see that uh, come true. Yeah. I, I want to touch on something you mentioned briefly um, about the importance of like really integrating your children into the, the lives and experiences and rituals of the family and people who love them. And um I'm thinking about how so many families actually are in a place where this is a big secret and nobody in their extended family knows that this is happening. And then the other adults in the child's life, like the schools, the teachers, the therapists, the doctors are all undermining the parental hopes that they can kind of help affirm reality for these kids. And so it's interesting that the affirmative model says, Parents need to call up everyone in the family and tell them you now have a grandson and not a granddaughter. Like it's the exact, exact reverse of, I think what you're saying is so helpful. And um, I, it just kind of makes me think about the importance of having a plan and like taking 
taking the situation and putting it back in the hands of the parents who know and love the child. And I just, I wanted to ask if you have encountered that where like, this is a big secret, but we're really hoping it'll just go away. Do you see that sometimes? And, and how does that work in your experience? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely have seen a lot of that. And so that's where I, you know, and I've experienced it in my own life because when, since I have come forward publicly, I mean, as Stella knows until last October, November, I didn't want to be named. I wasn't willing to do a podcast like this. Heaven knows I wasn't giving any speeches in public because I was concerned about my own family. And once my own family was ready to have me step forward and I realized I'm retired, I am not at risk. I can't, you know, I don't have a job to lose. Um, and some people have distanced themselves. And um, I accept that. If they cannot understand why I would speak up about this and they don't want to have a relationship I'm, I'm fine with that parents need to really think through that for themselves and uh, you know i think they really need to take an inventory of who is in their life family and friends and who will support them in executing you know developing and executing a plan that will support gentle loving assistance and who are the people that can be on board with that and then who are the people who are willing to put some energy into that so who in the 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 family's life needs to listen to which wider lens podcasts and you select out the water lens podcasts that they need to listen to or which books they need to read and and actually recruit and educate some some helpful um, adults in your life. And because it, I also find that people who are caring, compassionate adults who understand this is not the same as being respectful and kind to a trans identified adult. This is about helping this child through adolescence. They want to be helpful and they don't know how. So you do have to you have to come out to them. You have to sit down with those people you trust and say, here's where we're at. Um, Tess is not going to be changing to Tom. And we need you to educate yourself and help us. We'd like to have dinner at your house uh, in the future where we can all be comfortable. And, and then, you know, part of that is, so, so what questions you have? Because Adults read the media. The media says, oh, there are lots of studies that show this will save your life. Aren't you worried about Tess committing suicide? You know, and the parents need to be armed with the facts around how there is no evidence that Tess is more likely to commit suicide if we socially transition her. In fact, for all we know, she'll be more likely to be depressed. So what we need from you is this. And to enlist them. And to make that your focus, rather than going to school board meetings and, and uh, telling the school board that their policies are going to harm children. And can I ask, um, before we move on, because I want to move on to the, the public speaking, because you've moved out, you've gone into the bigger arena and you're, now you're addressing schools. But before we go there, I would like to know, have you noticed... I know you've noticed commonalities among the parents. They're progressive minded. You, you did say that. And, you know, they're, they're, they're liberal. You kind of touched on maybe Democrat voting. But is there personality types you've noticed among the parents that might come to you? I know that's a very specific group, but have have you just as a matter of interest? You know, it's I, I'm not sure I can say because I'll tell you why. These parents have every reason to feel incredibly traumatized. And I don't, I don't, I'm not one who likes to blame everything on trauma. I, I, in fact, there's a wonderful book that Michael Bailey, who wrote the, um, the article that involved the 1600 parents of ROGD kids and uh, the, the work that they've been doing. He referenced it when I, heard him speak about their study, he referred to the myths of trauma and how it isn't. About... I have that on my list. I'm, I'm going to read that I next. I really want to read that. Yes. Keep going. Yes. Yeah. 
Well, the point he makes, which is so important, is that uh, everyone's life has trauma in it. Everyone's life has trauma in it. So the question is, how do we respond to trauma? And how resilient, as parents, our job is partly to teach our children to be resilient. I saw a fellow um, wearing a t-shirt this morning, walking down the street, he said, weakness is a choice. Um, you know, we need, we need to teach our children resiliency. That's a big part of our responsibility as parents and ourselves. I mean, heaven knows I'm much more resilient than I was 30 years ago. Um, it, we, that's part of maturing. So, um, it's, I think we're, you know, we have to be realistic about how we position all this. And, um, the parents are so traumatized by this. They, they have so many friends that they know will reject them. If they say, I don't believe Tess is transgender and they're, they're traumatized by that. They have, they have, uh, family members that think that they have professionals that they believe will say that to them. They're in secret. I mean, just the fact that the parents we all work with feel they have to be anonymous, right? They're in secret groups. They, they sometimes don't even give their names, even to a group of parents who've been vetted, who are also going through this. It is so terrifying to them. So I find it hard to evaluate them. Because when I talk to them, I encourage them to see me as a reflection of how unfairly judged they have been. My colleagues have unfairly judged them. Professionals are, are, are letting them down. And I want them to know I'm a credentialed doctor and you can tell me how angry you are at my colleagues because you have every right to feel angry. Um, so like I have, I have a couple of parents who have tried to get, um, their pediatricians to get on a phone call with me and I've offered and I send my resume and particularly, um, physicians affiliated with Harvard because I, I did my medical residency at Mass General Hospital, which is the major Harvard teaching hospital. So I figured, okay, well, surely they'll be willing to talk to me because I went through that residency program. Nope they won't talk to me. And, um, and then, you know, if, if parents also, it's of course so common it this, the strain this puts on any marriage, uh, and then to have differences of opinion within the marriage. So sometimes I simply am the sounding board as people are venting. So I'm not sure I know what the personality characteristics are, because when I talk to parents, they're very forward, uh, forward about how how difficult this is for them, and I just feel heartbroken for them. Um, I will say I have yet to meet. I I haven't spoken to anybody that I didn't find deeply educated. You know, these are educated people, uh, and they're motivated people. Um, but the the complexity of what they're up against is is heartbreaking and mind boggling to me. I also wonder how many parents out there are going through something like this, but maybe they are either struggling to, to be resourceful and find voices like ours who are trying to kind of give parents a voice, or maybe they are so wrapped up in that fear of judgment and the shame about questioning that they dare not contact somebody like a Kate Goonan to, to, you know, get support or advocacy. So, you know, you by definition are talking to people who have made that decision to reach out and to say, you know what, I feel like something about this isn't right. But I would suspect that a lot of parents are in the middle of this and have a deep sense of conflict about it or like a gut feeling that is really troubling but they're still kind of bought into this idea that I'm not allowed to think that I'm not allowed to question this. I'm not allowed to feel this way. 
I think that's really important, Sasha. I think it's very common. I mean, because the other thing is, you know, as 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 Stella and I know, as as moms, you always your first reaction is, "I've failed. I did something wrong here." Obviously, and it's natural. That's what parents do, particularly moms. And so, um, how do we help them get? get past that feeling and realize, okay, you may have, you know, you might have regrets. You might wish you did something differently. I know I've early on, many of the parents I spoke to thought the right thing to do was affirm. So a year and a half ago, I was regularly talking to parents who said, everyone told me to affirm, we affirmed. And now we regret that we did that. And um, I don't hear that as often anymore. Um, now I'm hearing more from parents that say, uh, we just didn't know this was going on in the secret world of the school and, uh, or in the friend group. And we had suspicions, but we didn't know. And there, so I don't, you know, 150 parents is not the 1.6 million that are out there. Um, but it's very common now for me to hear from people that said, I had no idea this was going on. And now that I do, what do I want? What should I do about it? What should I do about it? And that's where, you know, it, it, evaluating the psychotherapeutic options and then coming up with a family plan about what is the cultural environment we're going to construct, that we're going to do our best. Because, you know, the other thing about constructing daily routines with technology social activities that to the extent that you can control them outside of school that in that expose the family to uh, well-meaning educated committed adults um that's something parents can do and they can you know moms are often very organized people and they like to plan projects and that's something that they can do that can be very helpful so um it's simulating the moving to another country in your own environment, taking up a new sport, <laughs> joining a new club, rock climbing in Arizona, whatever it takes. <laughs> Tell me, Kate, I know you've moved in, in within the Genspec realm, you've moved into a, a larger kind of arena by starting to talk with schools. You've started to kind of go bigger as such. Maybe because you saw how entrenched the schools were you almost like myself when I first saw saw the parents and I used to see them in the groups and, you know, it was great. It was certainly very helpful for them. And I thought, oh, this needs a much bigger, much bigger political kind of push if we're, if we're to move this beyond because it was it felt like. You know, we had a, a corner shop in a town that was doing very well and disseminating a lot of information, but it needed to be done on a much wider basis if we were to make any difference in the world. And I feel kind of the same arc has happened to you, Kate. You were seeing the parents and then you thought, I, I need to go bigger. I need to get into the schools. Am I right in that interpretation? Yeah. And could you tell us about what you're doing in the schools for Genspect? Yes, yes. No, um... No, once I realized I was, it was fine for me to identify myself in this world and come forward. And that, as I mentioned, was last fall. So six months ago, I got involved. So we're really right now, we're working on two fronts. One is, or three fronts, I should say, uh, a group of parents in Maryland, where I live, I live in Maryland, a group of parents wanted to generate a school policy for one county. And within GenSpec, we said, this looks great, but actually we need that one policy ready to be used in any county in the United States. And we need to adapt it for England, Ireland, Canada. And um, we, you know, we haven't gotten that far. Uh, we ha just have on the GenSpec website, we have one generic policy, which is more than a policy. What it is, is uh, an educational treatise on gender in schools. And it, it has a hundred references to the current literature and it's available on the website for anyone to download and use. And then we have people who are more expert than I am in working with 
uh, school district boards. So I had the good fortune to meet up with a, a wonderful father and um, retired businessman in Maryland, uh, Jim Lehrman, who's a former banking executive, started an organization called Transparency in Education at, in Frederick County, Maryland. And he publishes a newsletter uh, at, to inform parents about what is going on in the schools. And so they've been doing this for a while. And what we did was bring forward the policy to Frederick County in Maryland and proposed it uh, and it is a school district with a majority of people who are simply following the rules. So the current um, federal policies coming out of the Department of Education in the United States are very affirmative, uh, but they're not binding. And so a, a school district board can educate itself and can absolutely comply with any existing regulations, but not be affirming. So we've been working very hard on regular regular basis, educating the board about what options they have, the way they could become an innovator and show how basically, if a family firmly believes their child should be transitioned, the school district can work with them and do that. But if a family does not believe that's the right course of action for their child, the school, the teachers would abide by that. And the, the policy allows for uh, parents to be in the driver's seat. And of course, it also allows for if parents are um, abusing their children for any reason, uh, because they, you know, for any reason at all, we, we're good at managing parental abuse in children in the United States. We have good experience and policies around that. So that's not an issue. But we need to open our minds to the fact that different families have different values, professionals. There is a big professional debate right now. It is worldwide. We know that Northern Europe is doing a 180 on this. And school districts here that are enlightened should adopt policies that allow for parents who are listening to the professionals or listening to the debate, and they should follow their direction and work with them as partners. So we've started that process here. And then we, we have, um, I, I have in Oregon, Massachusetts, California, and Maryland, parents who are figuring out their own strategy in their own county or their own school district, using our policy, taking up the challenge of beginning to educate their community and their board, their school boards. And the fact that professionals don't agree, there is no consensus on how to approach this. And schools, teachers, teachers absolutely should want to stay out of this. They should want to partner with parents and take direction from parents and focus on teaching Spanish or history or math or whatever they teach and um, free themselves from the responsibility of getting involved uh, in a situation that could be harming children. I mean, no, no, I don't think teachers, once they understand that, would have want to have anything to do with that. They'd want to go back to teaching Spanish. So um, I started speaking, and um, the last presentation I did was a public forum, and it was amazing, and it was amazing and beautiful, and I'll tell you the story. So we publicized it at a public library, I gave a 40 minute talk on the medical science and I can't tell you how wonderful it felt to go back into my primary care doctor role and explain how the technical science, what it tells you and what it doesn't tell you and what it means for parents and children. Well, there were about 30 protesters outside with flags and signs. And um, as we began the session, they came in and they stood in the back of the room. So I was speaking to a group, not a huge group, it was like 30 or 40 people. And in the back of the room, there were all the protesters with their flags and signs. And they were kind of jeering and making faces, but they understood they'd have to leave the room if they didn't um, comply with being quiet, which they did. And then at the end, when we got to question and answer, 
And by now it's about 7.30, quarter of eight in the evening. The, the adults in the room didn't have any questions. They were very grateful to get the information. They didn't know the dimensions of the debate. They didn't know what's happening yeah. in Finland and Sweden. And so they were very grateful. Mm. But the young people wanted to ask questions and also make little speeches. And what was yeah. so inspiring and and heartbreaking, a lot of them wanted to talk about their mental illness. A lot of them, mm. several of them, wanted to explain their history of of issues and challenges. A yeah. couple of them yeah. sat, sat up front and asked very emotional questions about the they all stayed. Mm -hmm. They stayed mm -hmm. to the end. Yeah. One one young yeah. adult gave a speech and stomped out, but everybody else stayed and they actually stayed till the library closed and they helped put away the furniture. They were and they were friendly okay. to the adults in the room. And so what we're doing, it was beautiful. And what we're doing <laughs> is we're gonna go back. Yeah. And we're going to hold a round table and we're going to invite them to come oh, back man. and we're going to invite the caring, concerned adults in this community to come back to. And we're going to just see where that goes. You know, like these are people who I'm sure, well, I'm not sure, you know, we were speculating, are they living at home or are they estranged from their parents? We don't know. They could be either. Right. But they want yeah. adults. Yeah. Lives. They want respecting, caring adults to talk to. So we're going to go back and do yeah. it again. But this time is a dialogue. Oh, and just I love this so much. Talk. We'll see. Yeah. Way. Hey, we'll see. Result. Good work. I mean, that's the way forward. That's really yeah. the way forward. That's such a great way to kind of wrap up our conversation. Kate, this was great. If If people want to um, connect with you or connect with any of the GenSpec resources. We'll be sure to include all of that in the notes. Is there anywhere else you'd like to send people? Any other information you'd like to share? Oh, you know, um, we do welcome emails with a short description of, of the situation people are facing and they, you send those to info at genspec.org. We respond to them with the current articles and the current uh, information that's relevant to the story they give them. And then they send my email, which is kate at genspec.org. And I'm happy to talk to anybody. This is what I do. Um, I, uh, besides being retired and doing a lot of gardening, I walk dogs <laughs> and, and talk to people about this because I have some knowledge and skills and energy left. I figure I'll do this as long as I can. And um I just think, you know, there is so much available now. I love all the podcasts you all do. And I, I mean, I tell people to make sure they download the app and then go down and go all the way back in history and look for the titles that are relevant to the thing they're working on with their family. And be sure, don't just listen to the newest one, go back to the beginning because there might be one that was your really relevant. Oh, oh that's great to hear. Thank you so much. Well, I think this is a great place to leave it. This is a really inspiring way to end and it yeah. makes me so hopeful about the way forward. Things are changing, Kate, and you're definitely yeah, part of the, the better change. Yeah. They are. Thanks a million, Kate. It was brilliant. All brilliant right. Program. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. Listener support means a lot to us. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. For more information, visit widerlenspod.com. There you'll learn about joining our listener community, how to contribute to our show, and where to find us on social media. Our discussions are for educational purposes and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.